my code. Because I will be seeing. Okay, Lina. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar today. I am just going to give participants maybe another two minutes or so um, to log on and then we'll start. So, welcome and sit tight. Okay, I think um, I think we can go ahead and people can can fall in. So hi, uh, welcome to our webinar today, our best NTT webinar number five. Um, today we will be talking about our um, knowledge attitudes and practices survey that we have been doing for the last few months. And um, Celeste Chariani will be discussing the results of this study. And um, so you'll hear a lot more about um, what people thought, um, what our next steps are, what our insights are, and how we're going to be using those results. And then after that, um, Shane Bala will be talking about plants um, that are pollinated by birds in particular this time around. So let's kick this off one time. So just to give you a little bit more information, Ms. Celeste Chariandi is our science communication officer for the Best NetTT project. And she has worked in the science communication field for over two decades. Her qualifications are in zoology, plant science, science communication, and communication studies. Um, so she knows a whole lot about these things. And um, I would like to hand it over to Celeste to begin the first presentation. Thank you very much, Lena. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so we can start the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Celeste Chariandi. In today's presentation, I will be sharing some preliminary findings of a knowledge, attitudes, and practices survey on pollinators and pollination management in Trinidad and Tobago, 2020-21 to 2022. The presentation will cover the purpose of the KAP survey, how the KAP survey was structured and conducted, preliminary results obtained after five months of conducting the survey, how the survey results are being used, and lastly, a few points on continuation of the survey. The Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network, TT Project, notes that issues facing pollinators in Trinidad and Tobago largely stem from a lack of data public awareness and pollinator appropriate management. Very early in the project's implementation, therefore, a knowledge attitudes and practices or KAP survey was conducted to gather baseline information on the public's knowledge about pollination and pollinators, its understanding and valuing of the role of pollinators, and people's positive or negative actions towards pollinators. Included in this survey were questions to gather information on people's interest in learning more about pollinators and their management, which could inform the project's communication plan. 
The KAP survey questionnaire was built and delivered using the SurveyMonkey platform and consisted of 23 questions. The survey was open from September 2021 to January 2022 and promoted using social media and email. It captured demographic information, knowledge of pollinators and pollination, pollinator valuing and practices linked to pollinator management, interest in obtaining more information, and means of relaying information. Here we begin with some preliminary results on the demographic data collected. By the end of January 2022, we received 348 completed surveys, 67% of which were made up of female respondents, 33% were male respondents. 17 respondents were from Tobago, and 309 were from Trinidad, with a few persons from other Caribbean islands. About 56% of all respondents came from the more densely populated western half of Trinidad, as seen in the map. About one-third of the respondents came from the age range 35 to 44 years, that is 102 respondents. Another 21% of respondents came from each of the age categories 25 to 34 years and 45 to 54 years. A very large percentage of respondents, 83% in fact, were holders of tertiary level educational qualifications ranging from the associate degree to the master's degree level. In terms of occupation, the largest number of respondents were from the field of education, 25%, followed by environment, 20%, agriculture, 12%, and science and research, 8%. results on knowledge. Persons were largely aware that pollination is carried out by various types of animals. The more commonly identified pollinators were honeybees and 42% of respondents also identified honeybees as the most important pollinators in their view, followed by native bees. Ninety-three percent of respondents indicated that the pollinators contribute directly or indirectly to food production and security. More than two-thirds of respondents also believe that pollinators contribute to diversity of other plants and animals, a source of income for farmers, and aesthetic value of the environment. 97% of respondents thought that pollinators were extremely, very, or somewhat important to the health of the area in which they live. 63% of respondents said they understand what is pollination. On the flip side, 12% said they know it is important, but are not exactly sure how it occurs. Now we will take a look at the responses pertaining to attitudes. 94% of respondents said more should be done to increase awareness of the benefits of pollinators. The most important criteria used by respondents when selecting fruits and vegetables for purchase is price, followed by appearance, local versus foreign, nutrient content, 
and if pesticide free grown. The most popular method of pest control used by respondents is the use of insecticidal sprays, followed by a range of other methods, including the use of devices or no control method at all. The most common pest of concern were mosquitoes followed by ants, flies, mealybugs and rats. Interest in new knowledge. When asked, 70% of respondents indicated that they are open to learning new ways to combat insect pests. 68% of respondents are definitely interested in learning more about stingless bees and their importance. And 76% of respondents are interested in learning about pollinators as a whole. When asked what they would like to learn, responses ranged from the what is to the how to and the what can I do types of questions with respondents wishing to gain basic information to understand how to manage pollinators and to obtain guidance on how to contribute to conservation of pollinators. The KAP survey presented an opportunity, as indicated earlier, to ask the survey participant about the best ways to convey information. And the responses were varied, but were largely linked to the use of online media. The most popular medium identified was YouTube, which uses video communication followed by email communication and digital newsletters, Facebook, webinars and online training workshops, and websites. The preliminary results obtained from the survey are being used in several ways. Firstly, the results have provided information on the knowledge gaps to be filled and some of the practices that require amendment through guidance as they impact consumer choices and actions. The information has also helped in validating the key target audiences for communication and provided assistance in selecting the type of medium to be used in sharing information with these audiences. There are areas of interest identified by the public and where these are closely related to the work of the project. Our team will assist in obtaining information on these areas to meet the needs of the public. This webinar series is one such mechanism that is being employed to share information from key experts and joins other strategies being utilized by the project, including participation in public outreach activities and the use of print and electronic media. Continuation of the survey. While the results obtained have been useful in enhancing the communication strategy, a closer examination of the demographic data of respondents signaled to the project team that there is a need to expand the reach of the survey. The overall number of respondents to the survey was low and a large percentage of respondents were from the western part of Trinidad and were degree holders. 
as the survey was conducted during COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. Delivery on the online platform and promotion via social media may have excluded those who are not online, who are not digital natives. In order to enable wider participation, therefore, the survey is being repeated on face-to-face -face outreach activities and through interface with school children through clubs. The project team has begun making visits to farmers markets and administering the questionnaire to farmers, market vendors and consumers in these spaces. It is hoped that by the end of the year, another assessment will be conducted to ensure that the communication targets are being properly identified and tapped into. The BestNet TT team also will share new findings in a future presentation on this topic. I thank you for your attention and participation in today's webinar. Thank you very much, Celeste, um, for a great presentation. Uh, so what I neglected to mention earlier, if you have questions, you can <clears throat> either um, type this in the Q&A or you can ask us directly in the chat and we will redirect your questions. So we'll now be taking some questions for Celeste, if anybody has any regarding the KAP survey. And after that, we'll be moving on to Shane's presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? I am not seeing any in the chat right now. Um, Celeste, is there anything else that you wanted to share about your experience with the survey, perhaps? Thanks, Lena. Um, yes, what we wanted to say is that during COVID-19 restrictions, yes, Save Monkey did provide this advantage to us. And as you can see from the map, we were able to reach a widespread across Trinidad and Tobago. That is a positive. But definitely what we're seeing in the demographic data um, is that it does still limit you to only those who are online. So, you know, we welcome the opportunity in being able to go out. And as well, if any of you listeners are uh, teachers or so, particularly in secondary schools, please contact us at bestnet.tt at gmail.com. We'd be happy to share the survey with you. Uh, so that you're able to get your students to participate. I think we have a few questions rolling in now, Lena. Yes, yes we do. Um, so first of all, from Candice Amoroso, she says, hi, thanks for the presentation. And how long would the additional period of survey be for? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we initially um, did the survey between September of last year and January of this year. And we started our outreach really through clubs initially. Um, right after that, from around March, we reopened with the online delivery. But in terms of face-to-face, -face, we started the face-to-face -face delivery when we started going out, which would have been in May of this year. Uh, we've done a few markets as indicated in the presentation, and we're hoping to continue that through to August and then take another look and see what's happening then. Um, but we would want to close off the survey so that when we do the second run of the survey, it is really to see whether there has been any change, any movement in what we are seeing in terms of the responsiveness. People have gained awareness. They have better understanding of pollination and pollinators and what we need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Bianca Superville is asking, please, will you publish the schedule of which farmer's market you will be at and when to encourage friends and those locations to participate? Okay, so you can check our Facebook page uh, because we have been partnering with the Seed Swap Initiative of the UE's Department of Food Production. Uh, there's generally a flyer that is developed and we share it on our Facebook page. So yes, you will know in advance when we are out at the markets. 
and please share from our Facebook page as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Celeste. And we have another question from Jermaine Williams. Um, and this is, in order to get a greater response rate, was targeting specific organizations by sending official correspondents who in turn can reach out to their networks? Yes, that's a great idea, Jermaine. And as a matter of fact, we, we started doing that. Um, in March, we started under the project of communication working group, because of course, you know, working in a silo, you can only reach so far, but working with others, you have even greater ideas and, and greater um, opportunities for sharing. So through the communication working group, we have actually been able to sit to share the survey through other networks. I mentioned that we were going through school clubs. And as a matter of fact, um, through the engagement of representatives from the EMA, we have been sending the survey out through the Environmental Club Network, which is in secondary schools, and through the um, representative that we have from ETIS, which is the Extension Training and Information Services Division of the Ministry of Agriculture, as well as the Ministry of Agriculture, we have been sharing the survey. Um, quite recently as well, because we are also promoting the iNaturalist platform, uh, we have shared the survey with some non-governmental organizations so that they can share one on the survey and as well two encourage their membership to use the iNaturalist platform, uh, which is being used as a means of us documenting uh, the, the diversity of our pollinators locally. So thanks a lot for for the um, suggestion, Jermaine, and we are definitely working on that. Um, again, just as with um, my appeal to any teachers that may be listening, if you yourself have any networks that you can just simply give us the email address and we can follow up from there. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Celeste. And there's mm -hmm. another question here from Mr. Ramphal. Hello, Lena and Celeste. Great presentation. Would, you, would it be shared with us? There are some stats in there I found very interesting. Um, well, it is preliminary, so it, it, it is possible to share with you so long as you recognize that it's preliminary, very low um, participation thus far. Um, Lena, I think we can share it specifically with, with, the, with him if he sends yeah, us an sure. email. Um, yeah. um, yes, you can. If you want to, anything specific, you could always send us an email and we can give you some of the preliminary statistics as well um, that yes. you can then have a look at. I mean, the, the objective for us in general is that any data that we generate is open to the public to use. That was very important to us. So yeah. um, shoot us an email and let us know and then we can send you directly but eventually what we will do is we will put out um some graphics and some stats on on the when we finally have sort of the the full the final the report yeah yes definitely so this but if one there's is anything, preliminary mm -hmm. yeah but if there's anything that you want like that you that might be useful to you right now give us a shout and we will we'll get it to you okay no problem at all um, okay, so I'm not seeing any more questions right now for Celeste. Um, what we can do is we can go ahead and move on to Shane, and then we'll do the Shane Q&A after that. And um, if anyone has anything else for Celeste, you can still write it in the Q&A, and um, we'll get back to it later on. So Shane, are you ready? Thank you very much, Celeste, for that. Mm -hmm. All right, hang on one second, I will introduce you. So this is Mr. Shane Bala, and Mr. Shane Bala is an environmental consultant with a strong education background in ecology, plant insect interactions, and botany. He has worked on projects with various agencies, including the Ministry of Works and Transport, IUCN, FAO, and NIDCO, and is the project manager for the BestNet TT project. He specializes in plant identification, ecological assessments, and bryophytes, and is an active member of the local environmental community. Shane, the floor is yours. All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Are you guys hearing me? Are you hearing yes, me clearly? Yes, we are. I think I really got to change that introduction. It sounds kind of bland. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. So um, this is part three um, of the uh, Plants of Trinidad and Tobago Native Plants that Attract Pollinators. Um, for those of you who may not have joined before, um, I had an initial presentation which 
looked at just an introduction to um, pollination and plants in Trinidad and Tobago in general. Uh, then we moved on to some bat pollinated ones, and now we're on to the birds. Uh, this is meant to be one of a series. So if you don't see a plant listed here today, chances are it may be touched in the other one. And because there are so many plants in Trinidad and Tobago, of course, what I've tried to do is select some of the more interesting ones or the ones that I find more interesting and some that may not be as common. But in most cases, I try to focus on ones that are local as opposed to the exotics, even though you have that tossed in just for reference and example. All right, so let's get into it. Um, so if you look in the literature, um, you'll often see the term ornithophily um, as being related to birds. Um, of course, flowers that are pollinated by birds. Um, that is not to say that these flowers cannot be visited by other pollinators. Um, what it generally means is that primarily birds are the main ones, but you'll see in a lot of instances, um, flowers can easily be visited by, by bees, can easily be visited by uh, other types of insects. Um, the only thing that, that precludes them from not being visited really has to do with if all the general characteristics, which I'm gonna to touch on in a bit, are either present or absent. All right, so some of the features that we're talking about when we're looking at bird pollinated flowers, and this is, I'm, I'm presenting this, giving this to you in such a way that you should be able to easily go out, um, look at a flower and with very little effort, more or less determine what is most likely to pollinate it. Um, again, I'll point you guys back to the earlier presentations we had on pollination in general, where we looked at flower structure and that sort of thing. Uh, because inside of that, once you, once you start to get a sense of what they look like, what the colors are and so on, you can nine times out of 10 call it, nine times out of 10 call it um, with some degree of success. So the majority of bird pollinated flowers tend to open in the daylight, obviously, because most of our birds happen to um, go out in the day. That's not to say we don't have flowers that open in the night, and I'm not going to deal with those birds that visit flowers like that this, in this section. Yeah. So mainly day flowering and they open early in the morning, because again, early morning period, late evening, uh, most of the times when birds tend to be the most active. Uh, they show dehiscence and nectar secretion mainly in the morning. Again, um, stands to reason if the flowers are going to be open in the morning, then nectar secretion is going to occur mostly in the morning. A majority of them are vividly colored, with red being the dominant. Um, sometimes you'll have yellow, whites, and blues inside there, but primarily reds. Um, an interesting little point here. Um, so you might be thinking that red is deliberately because birds like red or attracted to it. Certainly the hummingbirds are. But as it turns out, it's, it's more as a deterrent to bees because um, bees don't pick up red too well. So the flowers primarily are trying to uh, exclude bees as opposed to deliberately trying to attract um, birds when it comes to the color. Again, there are other characteristics which together will favor a flower being pollinated by a bird. Let's move on to some of the others. So the coloration often um, from longer lasting structures such as bracts, stems and leaves. So what does that mean? Um, and you'll see later on when we look at the heliconia, for instance, that what really is attracting the bird is not so much the color of the flower. And in the flower, in this sense, from the corolla, the perion, it's going to be the color of the other structures. Again, your bracts, your stems, and your leaves tend to be showy as well. So they, they sort of guide the bird in, cue it in. Um, to come to the flower. There's an absence of nectar guys, although the office, and by office we mean the opening, shape may act as a guide, tubular in that sense. The flower is tubular or no pendant. Pendant here just means hanging down or nodding, means it's not standing too erect, but at an angle, often with nectar spurs. The lower lips tend to be absent or curved back. Um, Actually, the flower that you're seeing on the, on the right of the screen, which is really cost us, um, shows that quite well. There tends to be an absence of scents, um, no smells. They're not um, particularly fragrant, if any, because again, sense of smell in birds is not particularly strong. Um, interestingly enough, you have large volumes of nectar, but at low concentrations. And this has been looked at um, in a number of flowers. Um, if you would recall, when we look back at some of the insects and even the bats, you had a uh, nectar that was highly concentrated. Um, but certainly for some of the flowers, they're not. Um, this varies, of course, because as you would expect, hummingbirds require a lot of energy. And so they tend to visit flowers where they're gonna get uh, high concentrations of nectar. 
All right, so just in terms of the, again, looking at some of the features, what you have here are representation of flowers from different families. Uh, in the top corner there, you'll see an example of one from the Malvesi, that's Malvesia saboris. Uh, we have from the Cactaceae number B, C is an Acanthaceae flower. Notice the general shape. Huh? You have a sort of a tubular appearance in most cases. Uh, D is your classic Heliconiaceae. Um, and in this one, the, the, the flower itself is pendant. Um, or at least the inflorescence is pendant. And then, of course, we have the Scophrilaceae with Phygelia, Tecoma, and Tecomeria, and Salvia. Um, Salvia we have here. Um, I'm not going to talk on it today, but again, notice the general shape and form that you get with flowers of this sort. So let's say a little bit about Heliconia, um, even though I'm going to come to it later on. What most people see is not the flower. When you think of a balise, um, that nice red showy part is really the bract, and the flowers are usually hidden inside. Um, but again, um, as we discussed before, that is the part that really is going to attract the insects. So the bracts tend to be very, very, very colorful. So these are some families. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, it's merely meant to show some of the more common families that persons are used to. Uh, Musaceae, uh, Zingiberaceae, Heliconiaceae, Costaceae. Those were at one point all lumped into one group, but they've been split out. Uh, generally, they're the banana type um, plants. All right, so let's start looking at some of the more interesting ones. I'll take some time with each. So the Heliconia AC, the Heliconia is a general group. Um, there are any number of hybrids and varieties that exist, hundreds and hundreds. Uh, in terms of which ones are common, we have five native species here in Trinidad. Um, I've listed only three of them, Hosuta, Bihai, and Marginata. The photo you're looking at is from Marginata. So that's one of the pendant ones. So again, if you look closely, you'll see that the bract itself is brightly colored, red, the bract, not the flower. And the flower is just a little, you can just barely see it protruding um, in the uppermost left bract there. Um, barely visible, just a yellow thing sticking out. And of course, the lower lip of it is, is open. Um, if you were to pull that flower out, you'll see it's sort of tubular in shape. So, you know, it's ideally designed for access by birds. Um, bees are unlikely to go through all that trouble just to get it, even from the location of the of the of the of the of the anthers and so on. So this tends to be a nice plant um, put in your garden. A lot of people have it. Uh, what's not on the list is Heliconia citocorum. That's the very short one that you'll tend to find along the, along the highways and byways. You might see it in disturbed areas all along Mansingella if you're driving along the coast. Um, and that tends to stay pretty short. So he doesn't get tree-like by any means. Yeah. So those are your helicone you see. Uh, Costas is another nice one. Um, this was in the photographs before. So we only have three local species here, Scaber, Guianensis, and Arabicus. Um, there, again, a number of introduced, quite common, um, varieties from elsewhere that people plant as ornament ornamentals. Very nice flowers. Um, and if you look at them, they're typically looking almost like a, like a heliconia flower or banana flower, just very small. Incidentally, these flowers also serve to attract um, extra floral. Well, they produce extra floral nectar, let me put it that way, which attracts other visitors, which help to protect the inflorescence. So the structure you're looking at there is really an inflorescence of which the bracts are what you are seeing. And there is one flower sticking out from a bract. And those little yellow lines, which are quite nice on it, are actually where extra floral nectaries are located. Um, and that nectar is not for pollination by any means, if you were to observe it early in the morning. It's really to attract and visitors that will protect the plant. It's like its own defense mechanism. Um, I'll probably touch on that in maybe some future um, lectures. What's, what's the difference between extra floral nectar versus, versus floral nectar? Quite, quite interesting for those who are interested. Uh, this, just as well as the heliconia, tend to be shade tolerant. Uh, they can thrive in, in, in sunny and open areas. So again, a nice addition for most gardens. Uh, still within that family, Costaceae, you've got um, Geliocostus. Now I'll put it inside here, even though it's an exotic, because it's very nice. Um, I see it in a number of locations. Same family as your Costas, Scaber, same general habit and everything. But of course, the, the flower is a lot larger, a lot more showy, nice and white. Um, and again, because of that whole tubular shape, uh, 
ideally suited for birds. So many of you guys are familiar with St. John's bush or carpenter bush. Um, those are bird pollinated, um, justicia, which is um, a genus with, with many species inside of there. The flower you're looking at is Carthagenesis. Uh, again, quite common, um, not necessarily here, but well, it's common here, I should say, I mean, for those who are looking for it. Most persons will see St. John's bush and carpenter bush growing along the roadside. Uh, if you go to some of the more remote areas, I hardly see it in urban areas. Uh, I think that's primarily because a lot of persons are busy uh, clearing, clearing roadsides and, and that sort of thing. Uh, Acanthaceae, and again, a very nice um, flower addition to your garden. Black stick. Um, there's a bit of dispute on this one in terms of whether it's exotic or local. Uh, our literature has it as exotic, um, but it's certainly been so long naturalized here, but for all intents and purposes, it's it's considered a native by now. Uh, also known as uh, Pakistakis coccinia. Again, bright red showy flowers. And of course, you're seeing a trend here where the flowers are quite visible. Again, that tubular shape. And if you look in this one, for instance, or if you can just make out the yellow and there's a filament. So they're sort of well positioned that once a bird, particularly a hummingbird, decides to come near to this and sticks its head in, that pollen is gonna, that pollen is gonna get distributed all and all on the head and the body of that of that bird, you know. Um, wild exora, insertia parviflora. Um, again, this is one of our native plants. Not, um, I haven't seen this in too many gardens. Um, probably because a lot of persons don't know, don't know what it is and where to find it. Um, it's within the Rubiaceae. If you were to take a drive up on your blanche shares and just go off the roadside into the vegetation, you might pick it up. Um, easily confused with palicodia, which I'll show you next. Uh, but again, a very nice flower, and you can see why it's called wild exora. And those flowers, again, very tubular. So this is palicodia. Um, again, you'll notice similar, similar structure and everything. Uh, we have a number of species in Trinidad. Uh, this particular one here uh, means a small shrub, well, shrub, small tree, but they can get um, pretty, pretty tall. Um, so it's not particularly the kind of thing that you may want to have as a central addition to your garden, but you may want to have it on the edges. It's very nice. And again, a lot of, a lot of birds like it. And something I should point out, again, a lot of these uh, plants, you're, you'd be facilitating the use of local plants as opposed to exotics. Yeah. Central Pogon cornutus, uh, deer meat. Anybody who's gone along a trail up to your know, Blanche shares or hiked anywhere, uh, going to any of the falls that we have would have encountered uh, deer meat. Again, quite common. Um, you tend to see it throughout the year. The, the flowers are actually quite edible. Um, makes for a nice little snack. But again, a very nice um, bird pollinated flower. Notice the color red, notice the positioning of the of, of the stigmatic surface and everything. Uh, so hummingbirds, again, or any bird that has a beak that can get down inside of there is what this is most likely to get pollinated by. All right, just a few more. Uh, Ipomia. So most of you guys are from late morning glory. There are any number of Ipomias in Trinidad. Um, everybody tends to call them morning glory nonetheless, but these are very nice and attractive vines. Um, well known. Uh, medicinal purposes for those who are interested in that. Convolvulaceae is the family, quite common and very beautiful if one was to stick those inside your gardens. Um, I would suggest choosing the local varieties. And when we do finally put out the list of, of plants and their pollinators for Trinidad, you'll, you'll be able to, to, to see which are the local ones versus the introduced, because we do have introduced morning glory varieties here, which um, again are brought in for any number of reasons because they are attractive flowers and they look good in any garden. But certainly we have the local alternatives, which um, are easy to come by and which we should encourage where possible. All right, one interesting one I've put here, um, any of you guys who have been to Eco Savannas or gone up into Malau, any areas where the soil is sandy and a bit open, you would have come across Mandevilla Vosita. Interestingly enough, this um, flower was reported on in 1980 by um, Feisinger, 
I forget the other author, as being um, visited by birds. I mean, he observed birds visit this, which is, you know, one would expect. Uh, if you look at the flower, there's that central red portion, it's yellow on the outside, and it's tubular, right? But uh, a recent paper I came across, interestingly, no observations were noted for it. Um, this was done in, in Central South America. Um, in fact, the predominant business seemed to be bees. Um, quite interesting. Um, of course, location, as with all plants, plays an important part. You may have something that is predominantly bird pollinated, but maybe you lack the bird in the habitat, you know, or something that is bee pollinated and the preferred pollinator is not around. Um, but Certainly Mandevilla is an interesting one to keep an eye out for. It's very nice, it's a vine, goes well. Um, you can actually eat the insides of it. Um, I've done that out in the field. And again, one of our nicer local flowers. All right, that's pretty much it for now. I think I've kept it in my time. Um, I'm gonna continue with birds in the next series, uh, then go on to bees, or stingless bees, and butterflies, not necessarily in that order. Uh, for those who would like some additional reading material, I'd point you to Duncan's Guide to Wildflowers of Trinidad Tobago and um, Julian Kenny's book, Flowers of Trinidad Tobago. Um, both are good reference texts. Uh, Duncan has a number of small shrubs and herbs inside of there. Um, very beautiful, um, which make, again, nice additions to any garden. You probably have to go through and select for the ones that are bird pollinated if you're looking for those. And of course, Kenny's book is a nice narrative, very nice photographs. Um, if you're ever having trouble in, in knowing what these things look like, uh, that's, that's a good book that I would recommend. All right, so that is it. Thank you for listening. Um, and I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Shane, for that great presentation. So we already have one question lined up here from Rachel Lee Young. And um, she's asking, can you suggest where we can obtain the local plants if we don't collect them from the wild? Right. Well, unfortunately, Rachel, there's no other way than to collect it. Um, again, example, I was looking for some stuff to put in the pollinator garden that we're setting up down at Wasamaki just yesterday. And some of the things are put on the list, quite deliberately so, because I wanted local stuff. Um, you can't get them from any nursery. And so therein lies the challenge. It's a sort of push and pull. Eh? The nurseries will provide what we ask them to provide. And in a way, you will only plant what you can get in the nursery. So the nurseries are used to the nice ornamental exotics. You know, people see it, they open a book um, from North America and they love this plant and they say, right, I want that. And that has been the trend. Um, so a short answer is, I don't know of anyone who is cultivating these um, in a nursery um, to sell. Um, I know of persons who have it in their gardens, perhaps by chance, and they've allowed to go, or you can go out and collect it and find it. Like what I tend to do, I'll go out. Um, of course, there's a risk inside of here. I mean, I know I'm putting some attention on it. I, I don't, uh, and I think it's a safe risk. I don't expect persons to suddenly go out and start to pillage the environment looking for these things. Uh, and maybe inside of there is an, is an opportunity for some entrepreneur to go out, collect, and perhaps make it readily available. Um, I, I don't think the majority of people are gonna wanna spend their time traipsing through the bush looking for palikuria. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's a bit tedious. Uh, and there's the other challenge that for some of these, we're not too quite, we're not sure how they, how they are propagated. Um, cuttings, seeds, certainly the heliconia are with the rhizomes and so on. You know, so it takes a little bit of know-how, um, but again, therein lies an opportunity. Yeah, hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, so also though on that note, um, I know that um, there are plans for Wasamaki to start cultivating pollinator garden plants. So um, Earl is in the process of setting up the garden as a demonstration site and a teaching site. And once that is established, he's also working on um, being able to actually grow and provide and, and even sell the pollinator plants for people that are interested in putting them in their yard. So it might take a little time, but um, I know that he's definitely working on that. Um, right, so Rachel is also saying thank you. Maybe the team should collaborate with some nurseries. Um, yeah, so Shane, you wanna comment on that? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if on the, 
the project, we're sort of allowed to uh, um, endorse any one particular private um, entity over another. That is not to say, what I would like to see, of course, is that persons who have nurseries attend the webinars, avail themselves of information we have. We're certainly going to be putting out the, the plant list that we're going to produce with the floor visitors to be publicly available. So there's nothing preventing uh, nursery from doing that. Um, and there's certainly not preventing them from asking us for additional information. Yeah, I think that would be the best way to go as opposed to us partnering with a particular nursery. Um, you know, we'd run the risk of why this nursery and not that one and so on and so forth. And that's the challenge with, with, with government and projects funded such as ours. The process has to come under a bit more scrutiny. Yeah. Um, so, but what, what we can, um, what we can do is just by email and otherwise share our our list at the end of when we have our complete list of, of uh, what we what we know or what is out there in terms of information for pollinator plants. Uh, we can certainly share that with um, with anyone that's interested or mm -hmm. you know uh, mail it out to a host of um, email email it out to a host of um, nurseries and so on and see if anybody's interested in picking it up. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of the. Um, I, can make you know, I don't want to be controversial. I don't want to see myself I'm knocking nurseries, but I have gone to nurseries and, and asked about certain plants, and they say they don't have it. And then I suggest, well, why don't you, you know, make some attempt? And at the end, it comes down to profit, comes down to money. Yeah? So nurseries don't um, put too much effort into research and development here. Now, I play that from the point of view of going out and perhaps getting the plant, taking the time to to grow it, make cuttings or, or replicate it as the case is, propagate it, and then now say, look, I have this, I'm going to push. Because again, that takes a little bit of effort. And I have not found them quite willing. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope they don't take offense by what I've just said. Well, there's some other aspects to nurseries as well. So if it is that you're buying pollinator plants in, uh, in nurseries in particular, um, you should try to make sure that they're not sprayed with a bunch of pesticides for instance and i know that in in many cases um plant nurseries would apply pesticides because they're trying to sell the pretty flowers and whatnot and you know the the intention is not necessarily to sell them as pollinator plants per se at the time so um there are a few things you should you should look out for if you're going to buy buy things um at a nursery uh so we have another question from natasha mohammed and um is there another entity from the Ministry of Agriculture to provide nursery plants that St. Joseph Nursery once provided? Hmm. That's a good question, Natasha. I'm not too sure. I know there's a, there, they have plants available up at La Pastora. This is in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Um, and they've got places in, 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 in Tobago under the THA, like up in uh, Louisville and so forth. Um, other than those locations, I am um, not too sure. You got to realize as well too, a lot of Ministry of Agriculture tended to concentrate on ornamentals that were nice and showy. So plenty of hibiscus and cotons and stuff like that. You know, that has been the main thing. Um, again, I, I think if, if the public made an outcry for wider variety, then maybe there may be an incentive just to start propagating, you know, some of the more local ones. I mean, there's also a business opportunity in there that may not actually take that much investment. If it is that anyone is interested in growing pollinator plants, you know, grow a few extra, um, sell them on the side, that kind of thing. You know, might be something, might be something worthwhile looking into. But um, we can certainly encourage it from our end in terms of just providing the information of what um, what we what we know about what kind of pollinator plants are good for what kind of organism and you know sort of assist with guidelines in terms of how they should be grown in terms of pesticides um, fertilizers and that kind of thing to avoid any kind of ill effects on the animals that then feed on them afterwards i, I see celeste is making the suggestion that we are, could approach cpep to, to propagate them and you know Celeste, that may actually be because cpep is is government um it would be nice maybe maybe what we can do and i'm thinking it as it came into my head here is, is have um, a training module for CPEP contractors and, and workers, you know, um, letting them know of some of these local plants and perhaps so they know when they see it, not to cut them, 
and they can at that level because a lot of these plants are in rural communities you know they're along the roadsides and the bays. if we can get them to appreciate one that they're important and two to start building a little nursery mm -hmm. we may have something there yeah i like that so, yeah. thank you. So Natasha is also asking, perhaps the results from your project can inspire the Ministry of Agriculture to do so, make natural pollinator plants available to the public. So that was her comment. And um, Christopher Nakid said, good day. Yes, forestry has nurseries in Malawas and Joseph and Captiville. So that might also be um, someone to approach on, on growing plants for pollinators. Yeah, um, just, just a note on forestry there. What forestry tended to do a lot of times is concentrate on the mainly commercial ones, the timber ones. A lot of a lot of the stuff I showed you deliberately aren't huge trees that are mainly on the story plants. Um, and again, that has been a challenge. On the story plants for Trinidad have been overlooked in terms of propagation. So even at the level of forestry, um, I mean, I'm, I'm open to them challenging that, but that's been the reality. So you'll get plenty and you'll get plenty sip and you'll get mahogany and cedar and those things, nice timber species. But you're not going to get any palikuria. Yeah, you're not going to get any insertion. You're not even going to get uh, more of the plants I'll, I'll show you next time is like brownie or cooper hoop, mountain rose, nice red flower. Again, birds like it. Um, but I don't, I don't know if forestry has ever tried to cultivate cooper hoop. Yeah, and have it available for persons to, 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 to plant. So again, a lack of interest in those uncommon plants, I would say, which are quite common in the forest, but unknown because nobody is really making a put shine a light on them. Yes, I have another comment here from Rachel, which is it would be great if rural cleaning crews were sensitized to pollinator plants. So that is that is another thing, and we will definitely consider that because um, yes, they're the ones that are that are removing things from the roadside. And um, even if things have to be removed from the roadside, it might be sensible to, um, you know, keep the plants and pass them on to somebody that might be interested in maintaining them. Um, so on another note, I, uh, Shane, can you tell us a little bit more about the extra floral nectaries and what the function of those are? Because you talked a little bit about it, you touched on it, but um, what, what does that attract and how does that help the plant? Oh, okay. I was, was going to do a whole session on that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, then, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> no I, can, I, can, I can touch on it briefly. Um, as, as the name implies, extra floor. So it's not nectar associated with the flower per se. Um, as the IE, its role is not to attract a pollinator, which is what nectar is, right? They're given the, the pollinator a uh, uh, resource that they can use. Extra floral nectar, and we won't get into the two theories that led to it. From our understanding now, it is mainly the plant's way of attracting what would be a, a defender for it. And ants seem to be the best place defenders. So it's it's put out usually on a plant that's not the flower. Bracts are good. Um, they've been observed on young, uh, young developing leaves. Uh, the structures can be simply just exudates that's moving from inside of the plant to outside by no specific structure. And then you've got very um, complex structures like an inga. If any of you all have ever seen Inga Poado, if you look at the Poado leaf blades, you will see these nice cup-like structure right at the junctions there. Um, those are very complex. I mean, so it's, it's deliberate and you'll see a drop of nectar there in the morning and far the usual, you see an ant, whichever is the more common one in the area who gets there first is gonna come along and they'll stay there and they'll particularly take that nectar ever so. Their presence, um, as far as the theory goes, prevents other insects from um, being predators on the plant. So young leaves are wood protective and flowers are wood protective. And there are any number of studies that have been done to kind of show um, that, there's, that there's evidence for this. You know, you can follow on to see sets and see what the, uh, the, the levels of fruit and seed production thereafter is at by excluding the ants and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's been well documented. Not all plants have them. Um, one good local example, well, I won't use a helicone which that's the one I looked at, but uh, yellow, yellow, yellow pui, tabebuya, um, people might not be familiar with, but they have both floral and extra floral nectaries. Yeah. Um, they introduced um, rubber tree, that's Havia brasiliensis, also has extra floral nectar. 
And just as an aside, and Lena should be familiar with this because I think Marlon spoke about it a couple of times. Yeah. That is one of the reasons why persons who have beehives near um, rubber plantations, their honey runs the risk of probably not being considered real honey because the bees will collect from both the floral nectar and the extra floral nectar. Again, without getting into it, extra floral nectar, the composition is different to floral nectar because its purpose is different. So you find, for instance, it's higher in amino acids, which is good for ants, but may not be the kind of thing that a bee or, or, or butterfly would want. So a little variations like that. And of course, if a bee is harvesting from both sources, the result in honey is going to you know, reflect that. So that's it in a nutshell. There's, I, I think it'd be good to, what I had planned to do was put up some example of local plants that we know from the literature have exhibited extra floral and floral lectures. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. Um, also, you mentioned something about the color uh, being more the point of dissuading bees rather than attracting um, birds. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you think that's important? Well, I mean, so I, again, and this is just some, some recent um, stuff I was coming across because the prevailing thinking has been that it's the plant's way of attracting the birds, ne neglecting the fact that the plant may be looking to exclude something else. And, and in this case, it is excluding the honeybees. Yeah. Um, I, won't, I won't get into it because it's a bit involved. Um, the, the, the paper that led to that, uh, that, that, that theory there. But it's, it's, it seems to be the pattern in the number of the flowers. Um, not all by any means, but the main, the main thrust of it is that the, 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 the plant is trying to, to, to like I said, to, to prevent bees from, to deter bees. And in deterring bees, what you end up with is the other pollinators having more of, a, of an advantage in, in finding those other flowers and being attracted to them. Can I ask though, Shane, is it sometimes that the bee can actually access um, the nectar where it is without contributing to pollination, as opposed to the other type of organism that has to go through a particular route to get to the nectar and therefore will definitely contribute to pollination? Does that, is that also a factor? Yes, it is, Celeste. You're quite right. So let's come back to those other factors we talked about, shape of the flower. And if you notice some of the ones that I showed you before, where the position of the pollen is in relation to the nectar. So if you think of me positioning my, my anthra and my filament with my pollen to the top, a bee gets in, bypasses that and goes down to the nectar. While it's taking the nectar, it's not engaging any of the pollen. Eh? Yeah, so it's basically robbing me without providing me any benefit. So I, 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 I've defeated the purpose of having my whole thing set up just to attract the bird. So in that regard, yes, it's, 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 it's the shape of the flower becomes an important factor there. Again, as a general rule, tubular flowers, but there are other things we need to consider, timing of opening of the, timing of release of the, of the pollen as well. Yeah, timing of the, of the flower opening. Um, without getting into it, things like trap lining become important here, sequencing of, of when flowers are open, um, preferably for certain pollinators and, and, and their movement, as opposed to birds and their movement. So time of day as well. Mm -hmm. All those things have to be factored. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Shane. Um, so we actually are very much on time today. We are just, um, just it's literally almost two o'clock. Um, so I'm guessing I'm looking at the questions. I'm not seeing any more. So unless anybody else has anything burning to ask, here's your final opportunity. Um, I would like to thank very much our two presenters today, Celeste Chariandi and Shane Bala for doing such an amazing job and giving us all of the information on the KAP survey that we've done, how we're going to proceed, as well as the uh, nice list of flowers that we, uh, we can plant for, for birds. Um, so thank you very much for being here. And um, we will post this webinar as usual on Facebook page and then as well on the YouTube channel. You can find it back there. Um, if you'd like to look at it again later or share it with others or use it for anything else. And um, keep looking out for next webinar next month. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>